Tonight at 10, five party leaders in the latest campaign debate with Labour and the SNP at loggerheads. There were vigorous exchanges on the NHS and immigration before the SNP issued a challenge to Labour. So tell me tonight, no, no. is it the case that you would rather see David Cameron go back into Downing Street than work with the SNP? No, the Surely that cannot no. be your position, Ed. I fought Tories all my life. Unlike the SNP, which presaged a Tory government in 1979. Oh, Unlike your leader, Alex Salmond, who Ed. said vote Lib Dem in 2010, and we end up with a Ed. Lib Dem Tory coalition. I was and unlike you at this election, you fought Labour this is all your life, Nicola. We I have just a don't chance buy it. to. Participants did not include David Cameron and Nick Clegg. We'll be tracking some of the instant responses to tonight's debate. I'll be bringing you live reaction to the debate from our audience of floating voters. We'll have more on the events of the day, which included a £1 million donation to UKIP from the owner of Express Newspapers. Also tonight, the politician Lord Janna will not face a trial on child sex abuse charges. For health reasons, police have condemned the decision. Detectives confirm that a body found on farmland near Glasgow is that of the missing student, Karen Buckley. And as some migrants are rescued from the Mediterranean, reports that more have drowned, crossing from North Africa. Here, supply and demand, the growing pressure on school places felt by parents in the south. And an area of Heathland the size of more than 40 football pitches is devastated by a major fire in Surrey. Good evening. Five party leaders have taken part in the BBC's election debate this evening at Westminster. Some of the most vigorous exchanges were on the issues of immigration and the economy, but there was evident tension between Labour and the Scottish National Party when Nicola Sturgeon challenged Ed Miliband to work together to keep David Cameron and the Conservatives out of Downing Street. Mr Cameron, who didn't take part, was accused by opponents of choosing not to defend his record in government. Our deputy political editor, James Landill, was following the exchanges. A debate time at Westminster, but a debate with a difference. The familiar faces, the usual razzmatazz, the stakes as high as ever, and David Dimbleby holding the ring. But tonight's debate at the Methodist Central Hall was for opposition parties only. The Tories and Lib Dems choosing to sit this one out as part of a wider deal on the election debates. So at the podiums, just five men and women who lead their parties, and only one, Ed Miliband, who realistically could lead the country. The first question tonight. And they began by attacking not each other, but the absent Prime Minister, who wanted only one debate. Now, David Cameron has chosen not to come tonight. He's chosen not to defend his record. And it's a great shame that David Cameron is not here. And I think it's a disgrace that David Cameron is not here tonight to defend his record. But I want to see... But very quickly, Ed Miliband found himself under fire, from left and right. If you were Prime Minister, Ed, I wonder if you could tell us, would you be prepared to hold an emergency budget to reverse those Tory spending cuts? I haven't heard from you, Ed, a single cut that you would make. Not one. And I want to say to Ed, we share a desire to see the back of the Tories, but surely we don't want to replace the Tories with Tory light. And that's we not need the, to replace the Tories right. with something and, better. And, 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 uh, Ed Miliband, just... <laughs> like you say to, to some of the people on stage tonight, let's not pretend there's no difference between me and David Cameron. You know, Nicola, there's a huge difference between me and David Cameron. Just, just the three things that we've mentioned it. and so many other things besides. And look, the real danger in this country is of a re-elected David Cameron who doubles the spending cuts, falling living standards and a threat to our National Health Service. And that is the big choice on offer at this election. And then for perhaps the first time, they debated foreign policy, with Ed Miliband clearly trying to show he was made of prime ministerial stuff. You know, we've got to learn the lessons of the past. We can't have Britain thinking it can solve the problems of the world on its own with the United States. That is the lesson of the 2003 Iraq war. But at the same time, we can't withdraw from the world, because otherwise those problems will visit us here at home. Do you really Aaron. think the problems caused by ISIS 
Do you really think the problems caused by ISIS can be resolved with nuclear weapons? No. I mean, if you were Prime Minister, no. would you press the button if no. you had an opportunity? No, it's not, it's not about ISIS. But... The Labour leader said the nuclear deterrent should be kept. The SNP leader said it should not. You see, in 2013, David Cameron came to me and Nick Clegg and they said that they wanted to bomb Syria. And we, they hadn't thought through the consequences. It wasn't a last resort, so I said no. And as a result, the British Parliament said no, and then President Obama decided not to go ahead with that action. So it's right to be judicious about these things. Military action, a last resort, but in the case of ISIS, I'll continue it. You know, Ed's right when he says we live in a dangerous world, and Leanne's absolutely right to say that Trident will not defend us against ISIS. I take the view that the world we live in is not made safer by us renewing our nuclear weapons. And then on immigration, the panel turned their fire on the UKIP leader. Do you know what? Immigrants from the European Union into this country make a net contribution to our country. So if we can maybe just put the bogeyman to one side. Well, I'm afraid, Leon, I entirely disagree with the premise of your question. What's put our public services at risk is austerity, failure to invest and privatisation, particularly of our NHS. So you abuse immigrants and those with HIV and then complain that UKIP is being abused. <clears throat> Now, there is a risk to public services, but I don't believe that that comes from immigration. I believe that that has come about as a result of cuts. Is the job of the National Health Service to look after people here, or is it to be an international health service? And I can assure you, whatever you may think on this panel, the vast majority of British people want this to be a national health service. David, um, here's, here's, the, here's, the, problem I have, here's the problem I have with you, Nigel, is you want to exploit people's fears rather than address them. And with a hung parliament likely in the SNP riding high in the polls, Nicola Sturgeon made Ed Miliband an offer. I can help Labour be bolder to deliver the change that David. we really need David. because that's what this election is about. For me, it's about making Scotland's voice heard. But secondly, it's about delivering real change, not pretend change, but real change for people right across this country. Don't right. turn your back Nicola, on that Nicola, head and let David Nicola, Cameron Nicola, back uh, into Downing Street. I've got fundamental disagreements with you, Nicola, because in the last couple of weeks, you've revealed that you haven't ruled out having a second referendum on independence in the next five years. Now, look, we just very different. We've got very different views. I mean, I respect your views that you want to break up the country, but that's not my view. The formal exchanges are now over and the politicians and pundits are debating the debate. The question, though, is what the voters think. James Landau, BBC News, Westminster. Well, now, as soon as the uh, debate ended, the parties were then very busy trying to put the best interpretation uh, on their leaders' performances. Our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, is in that so-called spin room at Central Hall, Westminster, with more reaction. We can join her now. Yeah, that's right, Hugh. You've heard the debate. This is where the verdict will be written up by the press. You can see behind me representatives from all the parties that were on the stage tonight giving their verdict to the TV cameras, the radio and the newspaper interviewers too. Beforehand, many people saying that this was a big risk for Ed Miliband, putting himself up there and maybe coming under attack from all sides. But of course, there was a chance for him to get his message across directly to voters too. And many of the people here really feel that he did hold his own. But of course, not on this platform tonight. The two parties that were formed the coalition before this election, Labour, Lib Lib Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, they were here too to give their verdict. This debate was very specifically for the opposition parties and I think what we saw was that them in any combination in a majority in the House of Commons would be a coalition of chaos uh, because two of them want to break up the country, most of them would bankrupt the country uh, and the consequences of the higher spending, higher debt, higher taxes that they would all bring in would be very serious for jobs and businesses across this country. Given that neither the Tories nor the Labour Party can win an outright majority, I think the key issue for a lot of voters is who's going to be holding the balance of power. And on the evidence of tonight, the idea of a Tory coalition with the UKIP or a Labour coalition with the SNP is extremely alarming. And that's why I think people need to have the Liberal Democrats to make sure that we can have a balanced centre ground policy. It's a lot of nervousness, a strong economy and a fair society. You didn't hear that from any of the leaders speaking tonight.
Now, the exchanges that really caught the imagination here were between Nicola Sturgeon and Ed Miliband. She was really trying to woo him, saying she could help him be Prime Minister, and her saying to him saying to her, actually, Nicola, it's a no. But Labour here, they're pretty happy. They say Ed Miliband got all the questions because he was the only alternative Prime Minister on stage. Vicky, thanks very much. Vicky Young for us inside Central Hall. Let's go outside Central Hall because uh, John Pina, our political correspondent, is there. John, what stood out in this uh, set of exchanges for you tonight? Well, it was a fascinating five-sided confrontation, but the duel between Ed Miliband and Nicola Sturgeon, that was the most intriguing, the most enthralling, uh, I think, subplot of the evening. Ed Miliband, he was the only potential future prime minister on the platform, always going to be under most pressure for that reason. It was always going to be four against one. Whenever he spoke about his economic moderation, that, well, it may uh, persuade some Labour dousers around the country, but it will sound a sour note to so many in Scotland where Labour are, are under the cosh against the SNP and and an anti-austerity mood is putting wind in the SNP's sail. And he was also up against Nicola Sturgeon, who performed again strongly, who represented the fact that the SNP, well, they may be a power in Scotland, but they're a force in UK politics. And Nicola Sturgeon, again, I think, walks away with the Oscar for best newcomer. Ed Miliband, I don't think he's going to turn around his poll ratings tonight. I mean, he's not Clark Kent, and he's certainly no Superman. But he may have uh, convinced a few people that he's a little less of a liability and a bit more of an asset. And on a night like this evening, that counts as something of a, res of a result. And the thought, John, the fact that uh, Mr Cameron and Mr Clegg weren't there, how do you think this debate, therefore, with, with that in mind, uh, will impact on the rest of this campaign? Well, I thought David Cameron and Nick Clegg were conspicuous by their absence. Nick Clegg would like to have been there, ideally. David Cameron wasn't there largely because he was playing safe. So we got, all the same, a striking image. There were, there were five leaders, three of them women. You know, just think of that for a moment. The House of Commons that some people see at question time each week, that doesn't look much like the Britain that most of us live in. The debate today, that was more like it. It's not going to change the polls because they look deadlocked. And that's one reason, again, why this race is so intriguing. No one knows the way that it's going to go. Everyone's telling themselves they're in with a shout they might just win, but nobody, nobody can be sure. John, thanks very much again. John Pienaar for us there at Central Hall, Westminster. We will have more reaction to tonight's debate from voters uh, and uh, we'll be considering how it might affect the, the rest of the campaign. That's coming up a little later in the programme. Some of the day's other main news now. Police have openly criticised the decision not to prosecute the former MP, Lord Janna, who is suspected of sexually abusing vulnerable children in care homes over three decades. The Crown Prosecution Service said a new inquiry had produced enough evidence to charge him, but it said a trial would not be in the public interest because Lord Janna, who is 86, has severe dementia. Our Home Affairs correspondent Tom Simons reports. The Jewish community will gather in Trafalgar Square for... Lord Greville Janna. Through the decades, a prominent figure in the Jewish community, a veteran MP. But by 2013, when he made this speech, his last in the Lords, for both Jews and Arabs, allegations of child abuse were multiplying. He'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's four years before, and that condition, it was decided today, will mean he shouldn't face a prosecution, despite the evidence. The evidential side was not the issue. It was where the public interest lay. Um, these were serious allegations to, um, which took part over some time, an abuse of power and trust. Balanced against that was the fact that the suspect would not be able to play any part in the proceedings. A decision resulting in a furious reaction from survivors of child abuse. The evidence against him and the many victims and witnesses that have come forward would have made it a very, very compelling case to bring before the courts and I'm astounded that the CPS appear to have made this wrong decision. The allegations against Greville Janna have their roots here, in one of Leicester's leafy suburbs. Now a smart housing development, it was once a notorious children's home, boarded up after a scandal. This was where one of Britain's worst paedophiles, Frank Beck, preyed on young people. During his trial, one man alleged that there was another abuser too, Greville Janna. The then MP was forced to deny it in Parliament. But that wasn't the end of it. There were two more investigations. In 2002, police stopped their own inquiries. In 2007, prosecutors said there wasn't enough evidence. Only now is there enough evidence, but it's too late. 
The CPS now says he should have been prosecuted in the past. Leicestershire Police is reviewing its 2002 inquiry, but said today's decision was wrong and a blow to alleged victims. They're really, really upset, distressed, uh, and many of them are, uh, for want of a better description, sort of in a bad place. Your force made mistakes, didn't it? Uh, I don't know that. I want to understand that better. Lord Janner's family described him today as a man of great integrity and high repute, with a long and unblemished record, and entirely innocent of any wrongdoing. Tom Simons, BBC News, Leicester. More migrants are feared to have drowned in the Mediterranean when a boat carrying people from North Africa capsized. Earlier this week, 400 people lost their lives attempting to get to mainland Europe. It's estimated that around 900 more migrants arrived in Italy today and it's thought that more than 10,000 have come ashore in the past week. James Reynolds, our correspondent, was at the quayside in Sicily as the latest migrants arrived. Without a word, this group of migrants stepped off their rescue ship and into Europe. How long were you at sea? I asked this man from Mali. Three days, he said. The arrivals include this 10-year-old boy, also from Mali. Italian investigators have heard some horrific stories of violence at sea. Today, a group of Muslim migrants was arrested. They're accused of throwing Christian passengers overboard in an argument about religion. Making it to Europe alive is something, but it's not the end of these migrants' odyssey. They've now got to find a way of starting a new life in a strange continent. This week's arrivals also include these children carefully holding onto the ropes as they get off their ship. The youngest may never remember their journey across the Mediterranean. For some, life in Italy begins with a single slice of pizza. Hundreds of rescued migrants sleep on the floor of a community center. Others sit listlessly in the garden. Human rights organizations accuse the EU, including Britain, of making these migrants' journey more dangerous by not fully replacing Italy's search and rescue mission, which ended last November. Italy calls for proper help from Europe. Are you able to cope with so many refugees? Io penso che I think that Italy is not ready to face this emergency with so many migrants coming. It's Europe that must deal with this problem. Italy has sent hundreds of migrants to live in this old military base in the shadow of Mount Etna. 25-year-old Abu Bakr from South Sudan dreams of studying in the UK. When I was being in the South Sudan, I hope I want to be in the University of Oxford. You want to be in the University of Oxford? Yeah. To study? That is, I am going to study. The migrants lined up in the harbour may have similar dreams of their own. A promised land comes in small steps. James Reynolds, BBC News, Sicily. Police have confirmed that a body found on farmland on the outskirts of Glasgow is that of the missing student, Karen Buckley. 24-year-old from the Irish city of Cork, disappeared in the early hours of Sunday morning. Her family say they are absolutely heartbroken. A 21-year-old man has been arrested and is due to appear in court uh, tomorrow. Our correspondent, Laura Bicker, reports. This was Karen Buckley, just hours before she disappeared. A student on a night out with friends. And this is where police discovered her body, on a farm on the outskirts of Glasgow. Today, a statement was read on behalf of her family, who are heartbroken. Karen was our only daughter, cherished by her family and loved by her friends. She was an outgoing girl who travelled the world. We will miss her terribly. Those who'd hoped and prayed for a different outcome came to pay their respects. Everybody I spoke to, they're sick about it, they're just pure. Sick, sick in the stomach, that's the way... That's the way everybody in Glasgow's feeling. Karen Buckley was last seen on a night out at this club in the west end of the city. 
She was pictured on CCTV, walking away with a man on Sunday morning. Police discovered her handbag miles away in this park, one of several sites searched as part of this investigation. At morning mass in Morn Abbey in County Cork, where the Buckley family live, they gathered in shock. It's every parent's worst nightmare, isn't it? Do you know? It's so bad. After five days of pleas and appeals for Karen Buckley's safe return, this is not the story that anyone wanted to tell. Police forensic teams have spent the day on site and tomorrow a 21-year-old man is due to appear in court in connection with the student's death. For now, though, all thoughts are with this young woman, a much-loved daughter and friend. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Mulgai. Well, let's have some more election news then. And Express Newspapers uh, has announced that its chairman, Richard Desmond, has donated £1 million to UKIP's election campaign. The money's in addition to £300,000 given by Mr Desmond last year. His newspaper group includes the Daily and Sunday Express and the Daily Star. Our media correspondent, David Silito, reports now on the role being played by the press in this campaign. Richard Desmond, the man behind the Express. In 2001, he was backing Labour. He's now behind UKIP with a million pound gift and the cash is already earmarked to try to shift opinion online. If we can do that uh, by promoting massive debate online and using advertising, that's what we'll do. Of course, Richard Desmond's not the only press baron lining up behind a party. Read the recent headlines and the conclusion is... This is almost certainly the most ferocious uh, election uh, for 20 years. I think it's two reasons. One, it's very close. Secondly, it's post-Leveson. Take that TV debate at the beginning of the month. The Telegraph had no doubt who'd lost. The Guardian rather disagreed. The Sun went the other way. The last time anyone made it to number 10 without the backing of the Sun was 1974. However, a great deal has changed in the last few years. The Sun is not, unlike its main competitors, free online. So it's created a special website for the election. And one leader in particular is under the cosh. It's pretty yes. cruel. Isn't it? It's cruel. But we, we quite enjoy being cruel. <laughs> That's what makes it fun. There is history, though, between you and Ed Miliband, isn't there? there there's history between us in terms of uh, he has uh, made it quite clear that he's not uh, on our side. and. Uh, at, he's at pains at every opportunity to say that he's you know, the man who stood up to Rupert Murdoch. Uh, so that makes it quite is easy. Is this your revenge? No, it just makes it quite easy when it, comes to, when it comes to choose sides. But what's fascinating is a party not even trying to win over the sun. Meanwhile, over at the Mirror... Ed Miliband would talk to me probably most days, yes. I think I've just missed a telephone call from him. David Cameron? David Cameron, we have tried to, uh, we've tried in, to interview Mr Cameron. In the last five years, The Sun and Mirror together have lost three million print readers. The relationships have changed. We've had some newspaper interviews with the Prime Minister and also with Ed Miliband, but actually, you know, all the events, you're seeing uh, uh, an attempt, to, if you like, to circumvent traditional media. And at Facebook, they say 35 million election-related posts have been made this year. No wonder UKIP is looking online as the place to spend its new cash. David Solito, BBC News. Well, now, the uh, Lib Dem leader, Nick Clegg, has warned that if David Cameron fails to win an outright majority at the election, he could be forced to move sharply to the right if he's dependent on UKIP or Northern Ireland's DUP. Our Lib Dem campaign correspondent, Arif Ansari, has more details. Sealing the deal for the campaign. We all know this happened, but could this? A Tory government propped up by UKIP. The Liberal Democrats say it could. Bluekip, a block of right wingers from UKIP, the Conservatives, and the DUP that could hold the balance of power. There is a very real danger that Nigel Farage and his friends could hold David Cameron to ransom. The Lib Dem leader was in Cheadle today, one of 15 seats Nick Clegg says is at risk to the Tories. So he's dealing voters a deck of cards, illustrated with choice quotes from UKIP and Northern Ireland's largest unionist party, the DUP. 
The Liberal Democrat tacticians on this bus are worried that their supporters may be deserting in marginal areas because they're worried about Ed Miliband doing a deal with the SNP. So this website and these playing cards are deliberately designed to scare them into thinking that David Cameron doing a deal with the DUP or this guy would be worse. But UKIP's hit back, saying the Lib Dems are pro-European extremists and the Tories say they can still win a majority. But you're just trying to shore up your core vote here, aren't you? No, I think it is quite right for me as people start to consider how they're going to vote on May the 7th. But we also spell out what the real problems are with the alternative. Thank you very much, Jenny. But perhaps the bigger danger is how much support he's lost to Labour. Arif Ansari, BBC News, Cheadle. Let's talk about uh, another manifesto launched today. Northern Ireland's Alliance Party has published its uh, election pledges. A party which secured its first MP in 2010 uh, says it wants to build a more integrated society in Northern Ireland. It also called for an end to the spare room subsidy or what's known as the bedroom tax. Alliance has a completely different vision for the future of Northern Ireland from other people. We want to build a united community, a shared future for all our people, not merely manage the kind of divisions of the past. That's why we need Alliance MPs working in Westminster with the government and other parties to ensure that we put forward the necessary reforms. Northern Ireland's Alliance Party there. Now, ahead of tonight's debate, the pollster Zipsos Mori gathered a special audience for the BBC. And this evening, they watched the exchanges giving their instant reactions to what was said. So to find out how they reacted, let's join my colleague Rita Chakrabarty. Hugh, thank you. Well, along with the millions of people watching the debate on TV, I watched it with this audience of around 50 undecided voters whose reactions to the debate were converted into an on-screen wriggling worm. Here's a reminder of how it works. Our audience has a wide range of views, but all are undecided voters, chosen by the pollsters Ipsos Mori. Each person has been given an electronic voting pad to respond to the debate. On the pad, there are keys one to five. If they love what they're hearing, they press five. If they hate it, they press one. The data is processed and comes out on screen in the form of a squiggly line or worm, showing, with a slight delay, how the audience is reacting. Well, to discuss the findings of the worm, I'm joined by Ben Page from Ipsos Mori. Good evening, Ben. We'll come to you in just a second, but first let's go straight to our first clip, which is of Nicola Sturgeon early on in the debate. I think it's a disgrace that David Cameron's not here tonight to defend his record. But I want to see... I... I want to see the Tories replaced with something better. When Ed talks about cuts outside <coughs> of protected areas, that's jargon. Let me tell you what that means. That means cuts to social care, to social security, to local government services, to defence. So Nicola Sturgeon quite aggressively empty chairing David Cameron then. He would say that he actually helped to break the deadlock in order to enable these debates to take place. But in his absence, the worm approved of what she said. Yes, and he wasn't there. But she didn't manage to cut through this debate in the same way that she did when there were seven leaders there. She didn't manage to hit the same high points, quite frankly. But no, she's, she will be reasonably happy again with her performance this evening. OK. Um, let's move on to the second yeah. clip. So this is now of Ed Miliband talking about immigration. I think people should contribute before they claim. And it's why we've also said that we're going to deal with something which I don't think has been properly dealt with at all under David Cameron's government, which is migrant labour being abused, exploited, to drive down people's wages. You know, when I talk to people around the country, it's one of the biggest sources of concern and anxiety for them. So, interestingly, the worm approved of what Ed Miliband was saying. He covered two points there, really. Yes, yeah, so Im immigration is one of the key issues in this campaign. 80% of people in this country say that immigration is a big problem. And what Ed Miliband did in that answer, which is perhaps why people responded positively to it, is that he's linked two of the biggest concerns. One is that um, immigrants are coming here and taking benefits that they haven't paid in for. And secondly, that of course, that they drive down wages um, and employment. And that one of those concerns is greater for wealthier people, and one is actually for more working class people. So in, by encapsulating both those points, Ed Miliband did, did much better than perhaps one might have expected on this subject, and better than Nigel Farage on the issue. 
on, on immigration. Yes. That is interesting. Well, we can hear a clip now of Nigel Farage talking about social housing. Here it comes. By using empty government buildings, and there are plenty of them, we could produce 200,000 new affordable homes in this country every single year. But it's something we're going to have to start doing very quickly. And we should make sure that all new social housing is for UK nationals only. So that is very interesting because the worm goes up and then it goes down. So when Nigel Farage is talking about the need for more housing, he's with the 80% of the public who believe that there's a housing crisis and talking about 200,000 more homes, as you can see there, is popular. When he starts to say that they're only going to be for British nationals, people start to become uneasy. And this is just a reminder that, not, and we saw it throughout this evening, Nigel Farage is a divisive figure. He certainly has an audience in Britain, but 60% of people are concerned that he's too extreme. And what does that do to the worm then? Well, they go negative and often as soon as Nigel Farage starts talking you start to see people's gut reactions to the man, which is often negative. OK. Well, we've got another Nigel Farage clip and this is perhaps the most dramatic movement of the worm this evening. Let's have a look at it. Yeah. There just seems to be a total lack of comprehension on this panel um, and indeed amongst this audience, which is a remarkable audience even, even, by, even by the left-wing standards of the BBC. I mean, this lot's pretty left-wing. Uh all right, so that was the most negative it went. It was both a criticism of the BBC and of the audience. And, and as we saw, the audience in the room didn't like it and the undecided voters didn't like it. The customer isn't always right, but there's no point in proving them wrong, quite frankly. OK, Ben, thank you very no much. Problem. Just before we go, I want to ask a quick question of our audience. Um, on the basis of what you've heard tonight, how many of you have made up your mind to vote for one of the leaders that you heard tonight? Put up your hands, please, if you've decided to vote for one of them. Right. Interesting. So I would say between a fifth and a quarter have made up your minds. Excellent. And the rest of you have another three weeks to go, of course, before Election Day. And with that, it's back to you. Rita, thank you very much. Rita Chakrabarty there. And uh, let's have a final word then uh, with our Deputy Political Editor, James Landill at Westminster. Uh, James, some thoughts from you then on, on, on this debate this evening and how you think it might play out in the weeks to come. Well, Hugh, I think tonight was not a game changer. The dynamic of the election remains where it is. Labour, on the surface, will be happy. They appear to have won the, the immediate post-debate ballot. They will feel that they have got across their messages. And also, they will have enjoyed uh, David Cameron being criticised for not taking part in the debate. But, and I think it's quite a big but, Ed Miliband spent much of the debate being attacked from the left and from the right. Particularly, he spent much of the evening being adversely challenged and wooed by Nicola Sturgeon. And that is exactly the territory that the Conservatives want Ed Miliband to be. They say that this is playing very, very well for their core support. Ed Miliband spent the evening having to fend off Nicola Sturgeon. So I think the Conservatives will be quite happy with that result, even though they didn't turn up to the debate at all. James, thanks very much again. James Landell there for us with a final thought at Westminster. More analysis on Newsnight on BBC Two with Evan Davis, who's in Belfast. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.